Many people today believe that the Bible is not compatible with science. But this is only because much of what we call science today is what the Bible calls science falsely so-called. Theoretical physicists such as Lawrence Krauss, Michio Kaku, Stephen Hawking, and others produce bizarre fictional theories about the origin and nature of our universe that have no basis in observable reality. If people really knew what these so-called scientists believed, they would understand the truth of what the Bible says in Romans 1.22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So it takes no energy to create a universe. Universes are for free. A universe is a free lunch. And then you may say to yourself, well, that can't be right. Essentially, you can get a universe from nothing without any supernatural shenanigans. That basically, by quantum mechanics and the laws of physics we understand in principle, an entire universe with 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, can come from nothing because its total energy could be zero. And therefore, you don't need to, to literally violate any laws of physics to create a universe. And no, we don't know that for certain. In other words, the universe is for free. Because there are laws, such as gravity, the universe can, and will, create itself from nothing. And in fact, if you ask what would be the characteristics of a universe that was created from nothing, just by the known laws of physics, it would be precisely the characteristics of the universe we live in. Again, that doesn't prove it, but it makes it quite plausible. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. It is why the universe exists, why we exist. Then how did we go from nothing to something? Because in fact, if you add up all the energy in the universe, it looks like it's zero. Everything we see was once contained in a region smaller than the size of an atom. It's hmm. hard to imagine, but it's true. In fact, I wrote a whole book about it. Yeah, yeah, and we talked about it on this program, I believe. In the barest fraction of the first second, the universe inflated from something many, many, many times smaller than an atom to about the size of a grapefruit. Like, think of it this way, in much less than a blink of an eye, if it had originally been the size of a tennis ball, it would have inflated to over 90 billion light years across. This we believe, though we cannot yet prove, that our multiverse of universes is 11-dimensional. So think of this 11-dimensional arena. And in this arena, there are bubbles, bubbles that float. And the skin of the bubble represents an entire universe. So we're like flies trapped on flypaper. We're on the skin of a bubble. It's a three-dimensional bubble. The three-dimensional bubble is expanding, and that's called the Big Bang Theory. Our universe is just a, a small random accident in a vast multiverse, and it, it's fascinating because it means as each universe sort of pops out uh, falls out of inflation, it can fall out in a different way. It's like falling down a mountain. You can fall in lots of different directions. And each different direction that you leave inflation, in some sense, could give different laws of physics in that region of space, or at least certain different laws of physics. And if that's the case, it may be that many of the fundamental laws that we see and think are truly fundamental are just accidents of our experience. It could be in each universe there are different laws of physics, and that may help explain other paradoxes about the universe we see. So we're nothing but a soap bubble floating in a bubble bath of soap bubbles. And so, in some sense, the multiverse can be likened to a bubble bath. Our universe is nothing but one bubble, but there are other bubbles. When two bubbles collide, that could merge into a bigger bubble, which could be the Big Bang. Moreover, beyond our own universe, there might be an endless number of other universes bubbling into frothy eternity like a pot of pasta, water boiling over. In fact, that's what probably the Big Bang is. Or perhaps a bubble fissioned in half and split off into two bubbles. That could be the Big Bang. Some people get upset that we change the meaning of nothing. <laughs> or perhaps the universe popped into existence out of nothing. That is also a possibility. Most of the religious people who object to my definition of nothing never define it themselves. What they like to, here's what their definition of nothing is. It's Nothing is that from which only God can create something. <laughs> but, you know, they create this useless uh, definition. And so the universe could essentially be nothingness, which was unstable, and created a soap bubble. 
Now you may say to yourself, well that can't be right, because that violates the conservation of matter and energy. How can you create a universe from nothing? And space-time was created by the Big Bang, thus time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so it doesn't make much sense to ask what happened before it. There was no then then. Of course, this, like many ideas in cosmology, doesn't really make any sense to our puny human brains. It's largely beyond our comprehension. Otherwise, very speculative ideas, because inflation, even though it was well motivated, is based on physics we've never measured. Physics at what we call the grand unified scale. And without an empirical handle, it's all just talk. The highest dimension is 11. You cannot go beyond 11 because universes become unstable beyond 11. We have now, in some sense, hit the holy grail. Just a, a few months ago, the announcement was made of observations that really turn metaphysics into physics, that take us back literally to a millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, which is a time frame I never thought we'd be able to observe directly. And if, if, the, if they hold up, and I should say that it's just a single observation right now, and in science we have to be quite skeptical, we, it has to be confirmed before we can really rely on it, but it will allow us to test theories about the beginning of our universe and potentially the existence of other universes. Well, for every physicist, that's a kind of holy grail. These waves interact so weakly that they've really been propagating to us from a millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And that means that we've changed everything. And 13 billion years later, we have a way to see this cosmic glow with the naked eye. You take your TV set, switch it between channels. A couple percent of the static that you see on your TV screen is radiation from the Big Bang. This cosmic radiation is a direct connection to the Big Bang. It also reveals the universe entered a new phase less than a trillionth of a second after its creation. If you could go back to the really early universe just after the Big Bang, you'd find yourself in this seething mass of matter and antimatter annihilating each other. You'd find yourself in the middle of this cosmic battle between both sides, caught in the crossfire, if you like. In some sense, it explains why we're here. Because it turns out, and it's an amazing accident, and these were ideas that were developed 40 years ago, and we hadn't yet been able to test them, that the only reason the particles in our body have mass that can form together to form us and everything we see on Earth is that it's an accident. Because it turns out, if you take a bunch of hydrogen and you wait like several billion years, you might just grow yourself some humans. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. What was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. This belief system that today is known as science, the falsely so-called science that God predicted would come about. This science falsely so-called is not based on facts. It's not based on knowledge. It's actually a belief system. It's more like a religion. This is why a lot of people today will ask you this question. Well, do you believe in science? See, if it were just fact, if it were just knowledge, if it were something that could actually be proven through observation and experimentation, then you wouldn't have to believe in it. The reason you have to believe in it is because it's a religion. Because of the fact that it is not science, it is a belief system. And that belief system is based on two things I'm going to demonstrate this morning. Number one, that belief system is based upon hatred for God. And by that, I mean the God of the Bible. And number two, it's based upon science fiction. And I'm talking about Buck Rogers this morning. I'm talking about Star Trek. I'm talking about Star Wars. I'm talking about all the sci-fi that the Hollywood movies and the TV shows have made popular. That is really the basis for this belief system. And they say, oh, we're so rational, we're so logical. No, you're not. Oh, it's all based on fact. It's, it's all based on experiments. No, it isn't. It's based on two things. Number one, a deep-seated hatred for the God of the Bible. 
And number two, it's based upon watching too many science fiction movies and TV shows. Those are the bases, and I'm gonna prove that to you. Now, Romans chapter one, verse 19, the Bible says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now, manifest means that it's able to be seen. It's out there. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see, if they actually would perform observations and experimentation of the natural world that we live in, you know, it would just proclaim the glory of the creator who made all of it. That is the logical conclusion. But it says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Jump down to verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, what I want to point out here is that these people who deny the God of the Bible, these people, the Bible says, don't want to retain God in their knowledge. Why don't they want to retain God in their knowledge? Well, that's explained in verse 29 and on, being filled with all unrighteousness. You, know, you don't want to retain God in your knowledge when you're filled with all unrighteousness because God is so holy, it's a constant reminder of your own unrighteousness. Yeah. But not only that, it says in verse 30 about these same people, backbiters, haters of God. Now, that's what I'm saying about this belief system. These people hate God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So therefore, they set out to teach and preach the gospel of atheism. They go out to evangelize people that there is no God, and they do it in the name of science, but it's science falsely so-called. It's not real science. It's their belief. It's their faith. It's their system or ideology. Here are some of the big name preachers of this uh, science religion. Richard Dawkins, well, yeah. Stephen Hawking, Michio Kaku, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Christopher Hitchens, Bill Nye the science guy. You know, these are the apostles of this false religion. These are the false teachers and false prophets. But the first preacher of this sci-fi religion that I'd like to go over is Richard Dawkins. Now, this man is an evolutionary biologist, and he's the author of a book called The God Delusion. He's probably the most famous atheist, at least from what I've heard. It seems like I've heard of him more than anyone else as being the big, what I call an evangelical atheist, okay? Somebody who's just not an atheist, but they want to just preach the gospel of atheism to the whole world. And what's funny about that is, if I only had one life to live and I were an atheist and I thought I were just gonna die and turn to dust, you know, I wouldn't spend my life trying to fight against an imaginary being yeah. called God that supposedly doesn't exist. I mean, we've got Don Quixote, Richard Dawkins here, fighting with windmills and shadow boxing against someone that he doesn't even believe exists. What's his point? Why doesn't he eat, drink, and be merry? Because tomorrow he dies. Right. What's the point, Richard Dawkins? But he's a zealous evangelical atheist. Now let's see if his beliefs come from observation and experimentation, science, or whether they come from what I said they come from, a deep-seated hatred for God. Here's what Richard Dawkins says about God in his book. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. Well, tell us how you really feel, Richard Dawkins. You can tell here that he hates God. He hates God all of, in all of fiction. And he's, he's read a lot of fiction. I mean, the God of the Bible is worse than Darth Vader. And the God of the Bible is worse than the Emperor. You know, the God of the Bible is worse than all the villains of science fiction. But you know, oh, he's such a bully. So now, here's what's funny, is that there was a debate between him and another guy, and the guy asked him, 
well, how do you know that the God of the Bible is not real? And he said, well, the reason why is because the God of the Bible is this misogynistic, homophobic, yada, yada, yada. Does that make logical sense? No. To say that something doesn't exist because it's unpleasant? Yeah. Well, because God is the most unpleasant villain ever, that means he doesn't exist. Well, let me ask you something, Richard Dawkins. Do you think I'm pleasant? Because I exist. And I happen to be homophobic. I'm constantly labeled as misogynistic. I'm constantly labeled as being this horrible person by the world. But you know what? I exist. I'm here. Come, you know, as Jesus said, and, you know, handle me and see that I am flesh and bone and a spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me to have. I'm literally here. I mean, what kind of science is that to say, well, it doesn't exist because I don't like its personality. Oh, that's real logical. That makes a lot of sense, buddy. Well, that's how we know. And then he's asked, well, you know, is it possible that intelligent design is there from some other being? And he said, well, it is possible that aliens could have created us. It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an and intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. It's possible that long ago in a galaxy far, far away, someone, you know, planted life on Earth and put life here, but not the God of the Bible. Does that sound scientific or does it sound pretty biased based on his deep-seated hatred for God? Right. Now, there's another reason why these guys come up with this stuff that's not based on evidence, that's not based upon experimentation, but it's just based on their belief system. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. And here's where it all comes from. Walking after their own lusts. That's where it all starts. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, look, when it says creation there, I've heard somebody say, well, these are Christians because they believe in creation. No, Christians are not the only ones who believe in creation. The, the atheists believe in creation. It's just a different creation. Their creation story is the Big Bang. We'll get to that a little later. But it says here, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. It's not that they went into the lab, did some experiments and said, well, you know, the conclusion I've drawn is that there's no God. No, no, they're willingly ignorant. What is it that makes them have a will to be ignorant about the creation? They have a will to be ignorant about the flood. It says they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. That God spake the world into existence. That God said, let there be light and there was light. That in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It says, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So the two things that they're ignorant of there are the creation and the flood, which account for the physical phenomenon that we see in this world the creation and the flood. They're ignorant of those things. They make up their own version. But why are they willingly ignorant? The Bible says it is because they are walking after their own lusts. Now, more evidence of this is found in Psalm 14. You don't have to turn there. But in Psalm 14, 1, the Bible reads, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And often we stop quoting there. We don't quote the whole verse. You've heard that statement your whole life. Let's read the whole verse. The fool have said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That's the whole verse. So what's the verse actually saying here? He said that there's no God because he's corrupt and because he has done abominable works. So he doesn't want to believe that there's a God. The same thing is found in Psalm 53 verse 1. The fool have said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. 
There is none that doeth good. That's the reason. According to 2 Peter 3, according to Psalm 14, according to Psalm 53. Listen to this. You say, well, what makes you think that Richard Dawkins has done abominable iniquity? Well, first of all, we already know that he hates God. I don't think anybody would doubt that. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Listen to this story. This is from the Huffington Post. Now, who here thinks that the Huffington Post is a radical conservative <laughs> news outlet? No, this is a, God, a godless, God-hating outlet. And even they're calling out Richard Dawkins' wickedness. Richard Dawkins' pedophilia remarks provoke outrage. That's the headline. Richard Dawkins uh, has made some statements that some are considering to be a little bit odd. He essentially defended mild pedophilia. He said, um, Richard Dawkins, to kind of set the stage, is the evolutionary biologist who is known for being what some consider an outspoken atheist. He told the story to the Times Magazine of England that uh, he was sexually abused when he was a kid. He says that a teacher put his hands in his shorts and that it didn't do lasting harm. And then he said uh, that the, the exact quote was an unidentified schoolmaster pulled me on his knee and put his hand inside my shorts when he was a child. And he said he didn't think that the abuse, which he referred to as mild touching up, did any of us any lasting harm? I guess it wasn't just to him that this was done. It was to some of his classmates as well. He said that he was unable to condemn what he called mild pedophilia that he experienced at an English school when he was a child in the 1950s. So where are this guy's beliefs coming from? He's molested as a kid and he says, well, I can't condemn it. I can't condemn the fact that my teacher that was a dude molested me. No big deal. It's just mild pedophilia. What a bunch of filth. Yeah. This is the most renowned atheist out there. This is the kind of stuff he's saying. He said other children in his school peer group had been molested by the same teacher. But he concluded, I don't think he did any of us lasting harm. Wow. Well, you know, I've noticed something about you that you hate God. I wonder if that has to do with the fact that you were molested. Oh, no, it didn't harm me at all. No, it turned you into a God-hating atheist. Yeah. Now, you'll often find that people, when they get molested, they, they lash out against God and hate God and become a hater of God, unfortunately. Now, not everyone, of course, you know, that there's redemption there. And a lot of people who've been molested were able to, you know, get over that and live normal lives and live godly lives. But unfortunately, there's a tendency for those who get molested to be bitter against God. And they shouldn't, but that's just a phenomenon. He said the most notorious cases of pedophilia involve rape and even murder and shouldn't be bracketed in with what he called just a mild, you know, whatever. You know, don't, I mean, unless they kill you. I mean, unless they just violently abuse you. I mean, come on, it's just a little mild pedophilia. I mean, look, anyone who says that, I believe is a pedophile themselves. Yeah. Because no normal person would justify pedophilia like that. That's no big deal. I submit to you that Richard Dawkins is presumably a pedophile if he's going to say that it's fine. Why else would he be saying it's fine? Now, let's see what Richard Dawkins considers child abuse. Here's a quote from his book, The God Delusion. Faith can be very dangerous, and deliberately to implant it into the vulnerable mind of an innocent child is a grievous wrong. So he says that putting faith into the mind of an innocent child, that is a grievous wrong. But just molesting and, and raping it mildly, I can't condemn it. But don't you dare teach him the Bible. And you're going to tell me that this man is so smart and oh, he's so intelligent. And oh, 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 how dare you, Pastor Anderson, speak against Richard Dawkins when he has more intelligence in his little finger than you have in your whole body. And you're just an uneducated bumpkin because my apostle of my sci-fi religion is so much smarter than you. No, he thinks pedophilia is fine and that teaching the Bible is child abuse. You can't even make this stuff up. I mean, the truth is stranger than fiction. This stuff's bizarre, isn't it? And if you think about it, teaching kids that the, or allowing the, the notion that the, that, that the earth is 6,000 years old to be promulgated in schools, that's child abuse. 
Let's talk about the creation myth of this sci-fi religion. So number one, we talked about the preachers. There are these preachers. We talked about one, Richard Dawkins. We're going to get into some more. But let's talk about their creation myth. What does the Bible teach about creation? Go to Genesis chapter one, if you would. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I'm going to also read for you Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. We see there that in six days God made the heaven and the earth. That's Genesis 1-1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the sea and all that in them is. So there's no gap between Genesis 1 verse 1 and verse 2. For sake of time, we'll just jump down to verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Something that comes up with the plants and with the animals is that they reproduce after their own kind. This is not evolution. Now, when it says kind, it doesn't mean necessarily the exact species or the exact variation. So, for example, the kind of animal doesn't change, but you can have a wide variety within that kind. For example, you have a dog. That's a kind of animal, a dog, right? But you have all kinds of different dogs, and they all look different. They all share a common ancestor. You know, it's not like God just told Noah to put every breed that the American Kennel Club has listed <laughs> on the ark. Obviously, he's just got two dogs, a male and a female. And people say, huh, you think that all the dog breeds we see today came from two dogs? They think that all the animals we see today came from two animals. Hello. So they think it's crazy that we think a poodle is related to a Rottweiler or whatever, you know, or a Chihuahua is related to uh, a Great Dane, but they don't think it's weird to think that an elephant's related to a turtle. <laughs> right? So... Yeah, obviously Noah, and that's when they try to make these calculations like, oh, there's no way he could fit the animals on the ark. Because they try to put like every little variation of animal on the ark, every species instead of every kind. You say, well, what separates a kind? Well, if they can breed with each other, it's the same kind. Okay. So obviously you can breed different kinds of dogs and, and, and they can breed together and so forth. So everything brings forth after its own kind. Okay, what's the creation myth of the sci-fi religion? Well, now we're going to get into another one of the prophets of the sci-fi religion named Stephen Hawking. Because there are laws, such as gravity, the universe can, and will, create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. It is why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. So you may ask yourself the question, you know, well, how can the universe create itself? Because gravity. Hello, idiot. How dare you? Wait, wait a minute. Do you even have a degree? Do you have a degree in science? And I'm not talking about memetics, okay? I'm talking about real science. I mean, do you have a degree in evolutionary biology? Do you have a degree in astrophysics? Do you have a degree in any kind of science? Huh? Because you can't even hold a candle to these great men who preach this sci-fi religion. And listen to me, I don't care if you understand or not, the universe can and will create itself from nothing cause gravity. Cause gravity, case closed. And if you don't get it, well, you're just too dumb to get it. And I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> because there's a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Uh, it, doesn't this really bring new meaning to the verse, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools? Yeah. <laughs> now, how can you dare insult the intelligence of Stephen Hawking? Now, if some guy told you that in the street, you'd say, go home, you're drunk. <laughs> but because it's Stephen Hawking, you know, we take it real seriously and it's repeated in the news. This, this quote was all over the news as being profound. It's amazing. 
I mean, have you read Stephen Hawking's new book? It's fascinating. I mean, it's like a bestseller book. Did the universe need a creator? Not according to the physicist and mathematician Stephen Hawking, who argues that God wasn't necessary for the creation of the world. Professor Hawking claims that the Big Bang theory of creation can now be explained by science alone, without the need to consider some form of divine intervention. Because there are laws, such as gravity, the universe can, and will, create itself from nothing. It is not necessary to invoke God to light a blue-touched paper and set the universe going. According to Stephen Hawking, the latest theory is that our universe is just one of many. The laws of physics must mean that countless other universes were formed before the Big Bang. So would God have done all that just to create us? Well, the traditional religious view is that it took divine intervention at the very least to start it all. Scientists accept that the Hawking theory is controversial. Many theoretical physicists would argue that we are now addressing questions that not so long ago were, were seen to be beyond the realm of science. Uh, and what we are doing, inevitably, is pushing religion onto the back foot so that questions where only religion could uh, give, hope to give us an answer, science is now doing that as well. In the late 1970s, Hawking was elected the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge. Hawking's promotion coincided with a health crisis which led to Hawking accepting, albeit reluctantly, some nursing services at home. At the same time, he was also making a transition in his approach to physics, becoming more intuitive and speculative rather than insisting on mathematical proofs. <laughs> okay, so these guys are all about proof. It's all about the evidence, right? No, it's more just like intuitive, man. Dude, dude, just smoke this. <sighs> You're gonna understand black holes, man, I'm telling you. It's gonna take you, dude, this is gonna take you into a whole new dimension, man. I mean, you're not gonna need to rely so much on like these mathematical proofs. You know, I mean, that stuff's just holding you back, man. You gotta get more intuitive. You gotta get more speculative, man. Just take this drug, man. It's gonna open your mind to a whole new galaxy, man. <laughs> you know, it's more speculative rather than insisting on mathematical proofs. Who needs them? <laughs> Who needs proof? Well, Stephen Hawking himself admits that the theory that there are multiple universes is still just a theory. It's yet to be confirmed by any evidence, which may leave many believing that science hasn't got all the answers yet. Hey, this is what he said. I'd rather be right than rigorous. I'm not gonna be rigorous in my testing and make sure that, you know, this stuff's actually right. I'd rather just say I'm right. Sitting here near a theoretical physicist and you speculate about what might be, there's nothing more terrifying or, or perhaps less plausible than the possibility that the universe might actually obey what you're saying. In my career, most of the time, the universe isn't smart enough to do what I say it should. But, so it's really, it's really remarkable when these very speculative ideas that seem well motivated, but, but almost seem too good to be true, actually work out. Hawking has argued that com computer viruses should be considered a new form of life. <laughs> I mean, is this guy smart or what? Hawking has argued that computer viruses should be considered a new form of life. And has stated that maybe it says something about human nature that the only form of life we've created so far is purely destructive. Talk about creating life in our own image. You haven't created life, Stephen Hawking, you never will. Amen. Only God can create life. Right. <laughs> in an interview published in The Guardian, Hawking regarded the concept of heaven as a myth, believing that there is no heaven or afterlife. And that such a notion, and that such a notion was a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. Hawking has stated that given the vastness of the universe, aliens likely exist, but that contact with them should be avoided. Now here's the thing about that, is that there's no evidence for aliens. None. Zero. Zilch. 
Not a, but yet when you listen to these atheist scientists, they all talk about aliens. Why? Because it's based on two things, deep-seated hatred for the God of the Bible, but don't forget element number two, science fiction is a major source. I love to watch science fiction movies, but I cringe. I cringe whenever I see a depiction of the aliens. First of all, the aliens speak perfect English, not just British English, they speak perfect American English. And obviously they're a human inside some kind of monkey soup. When we physicists look for alien civilizations, we don't look for little green men. When we physicists look in outer space for alien life, we don't look for little green men. We look for type one, type two, and type three civilizations. A type one civilization has harnessed planetary power. They control earthquakes, the weather, volcanoes. They have cities on the ocean. Anything planetary, they control. That's type one. A planetary civilization. A civilization that uh, resembles something out of Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. A type two civilization is stellar. They consume so much energy, they can play with stars. That's, for example, the Federation of Planets in Star Trek. Star Trek would represent a typical type two civilization. They play with stars. They are immortal. Nothing known to science can destroy a type two civilization. Then we have type three, which is galactic. And the empire of Star Wars would correspond to a type three civilization. Now, what are we on this scale? Now on this scale, are we type one that control hurricanes? Are we type two that control star systems? Are we type three that roam the galactic space lanes? No, we're type zero. Let's jump to the fourth point, the eschatology of the sci-fi religion, okay? the eschatology or end times beliefs of this sci-fi religion. Now, when we think of our eschatology, it has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And again, eschatology is just a fancy schmancy word for the study of end times or the study of last things, okay? Well, our eschatology focuses upon what? The second coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation that gives end times prophecy, it starts out talking about the second coming of Christ. He says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And then it ends with, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth the sayings of this book. So it starts out and ends with, that's the theme, right? The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's an eschatology of the sci-fi religion that has to do with the coming of aliens. So we look to the coming of Christ, they look for the coming of aliens. I mean, you talk about these guys, they say, well, you know, inevitably, eventually, we're gonna come into contact with aliens. Kind of like we're waiting for Jesus to come back. They're waiting for aliens. <laughs> They're waiting for the UFOs to show up, okay. A lot of them are kind of scared of these UFOs too, and saying it's not gonna be, it's gonna be like when Columbus came to the Indians. It didn't go so well for the Indians. That's how it's gonna be when the aliens come to us, okay. But part of their eschatology in this sci-fi religion is that they desire a one world government and a one world religion. Now I'm just going to briefly touch upon one of the apostles of the sci-fi religion named Michio Kaku. This guy Michio Kaku is a very famous astrophysicist and he says that if you're not for one world government, if you're against one world government, you're a terrorist. Anyone who doesn't want one world government, he basically says, you're a terrorist because you have to understand that it's our destiny. The transition between type zero and type one. And that's where we are today. And so this transition is perhaps the most important transition of all time. Some people don't want it. They fear this transition because this transition is to a planetary civilization tolerant of many cultures. These are the terrorists. The, in their gut, they fear this because they know they are witnessing the birth pangs of a beginning of a new planetary civilization and the terrorists want nothing to do with it. What is terrorism? Terrorism in some sense is a reaction against the creation of a type one civilization. 
they don't like the, the march toward a type 1 civilization. Now, which tendency will win? I don't know. But I hope that we emerge as a type 1 civilization. But here's the problem. No one's ever discovered a type 1 civilization. There's no such thing as a type 1, type 2, or type 3. Even he'll admit there's no evidence that there's any aliens even out there. When we look at outer space, we see no evidence of type 1, 2, or 3 anywhere. No evidence whatsoever. The mathematics say that there should be thousands of type 1, 2, and 3 civilizations in the galaxy. We see no evidence of any whatsoever. But yet he has this whole grading scale. So it'd be sort of like this. It'd be sort of like if I said, you know, basketball players can be put in three categories. Type 1, type 2, and type 3. A type 1 basketball player can dunk the ball on a 15-foot rim. A type 2 basketball player can dunk the ball on a 20-foot rim. A type 3 basketball player can dunk the ball on a 25-foot rim. You know what Michael Jordan is? Type 0. You know what Shaquille O'Neal is? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? You know what these guys are? They're type 0. Now wouldn't that be ridiculous and stupid? Since there's no one who could do those things? It doesn't exist. But this is the thing that you can expect to hear from someone like Michio Kaka and his, you know, his, his inflated ego of his, you know, overstated intelligence that, you know, we're looking for type one, top two, and top three civilizations. Come on, haven't you seen Buck Rogers? Haven't you seen Star Trek? Haven't you seen Star Wars? And he said, the only way we're gonna make it from a type zero to a type one is a one world government. That's the only way. We must unite in a one world system. And the people who don't want to unite are terrorists. Look at Psalm 2 verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. And that's what we see now, the rulers uniting together, the United Nations, and they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed or, or his Christ saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You say, why do you laugh at these guys this morning? Why do you mock them? Why do you mock a guy in a wheelchair? I mean, come on, you wouldn't mock a guy in glasses, would you? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. The reason I mock, the, the Lord's going to mock. Amen. He said, I'll mock when your fear cometh. The Lord shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. We know it's the Antichrist who wants a one world government, that wants a new world order. This sci-fi religion is in direct opposition with God's plan for this world. They want that which the devil wants. That's what it all comes down to. These apostles of sci-fi religion, I'll tell you why they're being propped up by the media, because the media is run by people who want a one world system, a conspiracy to create a new world order is what is behind propping up these really smart guys that aren't really quite as smart as we thought, are they? It's about a new world order. It's about the devil. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the clear teaching of your word, Lord. And I thank you so much for the Baptist preachers that I grew up listening to and the Baptist preachers that I would look at today and, and look up to and, and, and uh, listen to their words and that I don't have to listen to these kind of foolish apostles of sci-fi. Lord, thank you that we have the word of God, which is never changing, always true, and beats any science textbook any day of the week. You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going.
Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? Because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there, 
First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus, okay? But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what if all our, we did all these wonderful works, why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me, I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me, I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.